the National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Deadhead Freight. Shortly before midnight, August 27, 1938, at the Santa Fe Freight Yards in Lubbock, Texas. A deadhead freight hauling empties back to the West Coast from Galveston has just pulled into the yard. The brakeman and a railroad detective are making a routine check of the cars for free-riding hobos. If I was a yard dick, I'd be snoozing in the roundhouse. You ain't found a free-rider in months. Yes, so what? I get paid to check, and I check. Oh, you know, Bo's on the freights always hop off before we pull into the yards. You ever think one of them might fall asleep in the car and not have anybody to wake him up? Well, could be. Yeah, flash your light in this one. Okay. Hey, see? Nobody. Mm. Now, the car up ahead is the last of the boxcars. I walked the flats and gondolas while we was rolling, so I know that they're clear. Hey, hey, why's the door rolled shut on this one? Well, I don't know now. Shouldn't be. Now let's get her open. And throw your light around. Yeah. Mm. Nobody riding, huh? <laughs> Come on. All right, Bo. On your feet. And throw that light right on him. Yeah. Well, no wonder it didn't move just an old duffel bag. Yeah. Well, what's a duffel bag doing on a deadhead freight? Ain't there something in it, huh? Hey, hey, come here. Feel this. All right. Feels like a body. Hey, you got a knife on you? Yeah, here. That's a good thing we didn't pass this car. The top of the bag sewed up tight. I'll have to cut right through the side. Yeah. What? It's a young woman. Yeah. Stabbed to death. And throw that light around the car. Well, what are you looking for? There's no blood any place. She wasn't killed on the train. Somebody must have loaded the body on to get rid of it. Yeah, so the murder can't be pinned down to any definite area. Hey, where'd you stop last, before you pulled in here? A siding west of Sweetwater? The body must have been put on someplace between there and Galveston, then. We better call the police. Eh? They can notify the Texas Rangers. <laughs> After a brief but penetrating study of the situation, Ranger Captain Stinson had the body removed to a Lubbock funeral parlor. He then requested Texas Ranger Jace Pearson to take over the case. Well, there it is, Jace. Pretty brutal job of stabbing. You figure it happened a good piece from here, huh? Couple of reasons for that. Here's a map. Shows the route the freight train took. Spot circled in red shows where it made stops. And at what time. I see. No stops after it left the siding outside Sweetwater, huh? Right. And most of the stops were made much further east. Hmm. Well, according to the time of these stops, body must have been loaded on the train between Presby here and Turner City here. Well, how do you arrive at that? Train made all its night stops between these points. Isn't likely the killer loaded the body on by daylight. Too much chance of being spotted by the train crew. Well, that's good reasoning, Jace. You may be right. You said the body was sewed up in a duffel bag. Yeah, you better look at it before I send it on to the lab. Mm. I have the undertaker lock it in this cabinet and give me the key. Yeah, here it is. Regular opening at the top of the bag is sewed up tight. The draw cord is missing. See? Uh-huh. Good thing the man who found the body cut into the bag instead of ripping out those new stitches. Yeah, I see what you mean. 
Kind of funny stitching. It may have been made by somebody with a special trade where that kind of stitching's used. Lab gets a look at it, may be able to tell us what trade. Well, I hope so. The bag itself won't help much, I'm afraid. Uh, probably picked up in war surplus. Could belong to anybody. Hey, look at this, the bottom of the bag. It's kind of soiled. Whoever carted it around with a body in it must have set it on the ground to rest. He sure did, on reddish brown earth. Blood seepage made some of it stick. Let's have a look at that train map again. I think that earth stain kind of narrows down our search, Captain. Oh? How come? I know the country that train passed at night. I've been over it plenty. Only place I've seen earth that color is right around this area in a few stream beds. Cotton Belt runs parallel to the railroad for about 40 miles through there. Well, I've seen all I want to see, unless you have something else. Nope. Let's go. I'll get this bag off to Austin. Body going to be held here for identification? Yeah. If she isn't identified, we'll see if we can run down something by her clothes. Any laundry marks or anything on them? Afraid not, Jace. Homemade and home laundered. No dental work to help us either. And her fingerprints aren't on the file. Might have a man check on the shoes she was wearing. They weren't homemade. Yeah, we'll try it. You got any ideas about what you're going to do? If it's all right with you, I'd like to take a crack at that cotton belt area. Tow charcoal down on the horse trailer and then ride parallel to the railroad tracks and see what I can find. Well, that's a lot of territory. How about Steve Clark riding with you? Good deal. We get anything from the lab, I'll let you know. I'll radio Clark and assign him. Then you can pick him up on the way. Good luck, Jace. Thanks, Captain. You'll hear from me. I met Clark. We drove down to the beginning of the area I wanted to check, left the car, and used our horses for the long ride along the rail bed. By noon of the next day, we'd covered 15 miles. Horses are getting tired, Jase. I know. But there's a siding a little ways ahead. Freight stopped there. Yeah. Look, another culvert coming up. Yeah. Uh, bank's pretty steep. Watch your horse. All right. Careful, boy. Easy, charcoal. Careful. Easy. Steep climb out of here, Jase. Maybe if we ride... Hey, what are you looking at? Oh, the ground, huh? Yeah. Same reddish-brown color we've been checking for. Well, don't see anything else, though. Want to ride through it a ways? Yeah. Come on, charcoal. Oh, boy, I don't want to be a killjoy, Jace, but we've done this in a dozen creek beds. Yeah, but none of the others were as close to a train stop. Siding's only about 50 yards further up the... Ooh, ooh, charcoal. Ooh, boy, ooh. Find something, Jace? Yeah, come here. Well, what is it? Yeah, marks in the sand. Trace of a couple of footprints, not enough to make a cast, but look at this other mark. A round impression. Yeah, what made it? Might have been somebody setting that duffel bag down. Yeah? Well, that would account for the dirt you found on the bag. We'll find out. Get a glass jar from your saddle pack, will Okay. You? Gonna cut a core around that, Mark? Yeah. Lab can test it for blood trace. Earth this color, we can't tell anything by sight. Well, here's the jar. Thanks. A few empty cans around here, Jace. Those marks might have been made by a hobo. I don't think so. Bindle stiffs travel light. They don't carry duffel bags. What's the nearest town to here? Uh, Bullville, about a mile further on. Well, let's get there. We can phone for a highway patrol car, and they can drive you back and pick up our car. All right. You going to check around Bullville? With a fine-tooth comb. The cotton crop around Bullville was good. Too good. Migratory pickers were jamming the town. I had photos of the dead girl and tried to find somebody who might have seen her. No. No, Ranger. Never saw her around the gin here. Town's full up, though. It's possible one of the pickers saw her someplace. You know anybody who comes in contact with a lot of the pickers? No, no. Afraid you have to tackle them crew by crew. That's what I was trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Must be a couple of thousand migratories around. You mind if I ask your man at the weighing platform to check with the haulers when they bring cotton in for ginning? No, it's all right with me. Thanks. Oh, uh, uh, Ranger. Yeah. Hold it a second. Uh, just happened to think. There is somebody who gets to see a lot of the pickers. Who? A Mexican woman. Name's old Rosie. Drives a junky old truck around peddling soda pop in the fields. You know where I can locate her? Yeah, haulers give you lift out to the fields. And somebody will steer you out to her. <laughs> Everybody knows old Rosie. Hey. So 
Somebody killed that poor girl, huh? That's right, Rosie. You ever see her? You find who killed her, you're going to put him in a jail? That's my job. How about it? You ever seen her around here? She, one time. Where? At the bus station in the town. She was with a man. You know who the man was? No, senor. Why'd you hesitate? Is that the truth? Why should I tell a lie, senor? I don't know who the man was. She described the man, a vague, stumbling description that might fit anybody. And while she described him, I had a feeling she was lying. A feeling that was strengthened by a faint odor of whiskey coming from the truck. Whatever business Rosie was in, it wasn't limited to the sale of soft drinks. I pretended to swallow her story, then I got a lift back to town where Steve Clark was waiting with our car. Better hop in, Jase. Just had a call from Austin. Yeah, they checked the earth sample we sent in in a jar. Yeah, blood trace, all right. Same type as the victims. They got a line on a few other things, too. The shoes on the dead girl have been traced through the manufacturer to a store in Sheffield. Here, I wrote down the name of the store and the address. We better get over there and see if we can establish identity. Yeah, shoes will be waiting at the Sheffield airport. It isn't likely that a shoe clerk is going to remember who he sold them to, though. I saw the shoes. They've been repaired recently. Whoever fixed them might remember. Well, that's a chance. Any information on that duffel bag? Uh, yeah, a lab ties it in with a seaman. How? Oh. Well, stitches used to sew up the bag are the kind seaman used to mend a torn sail. Hmm. Chase, you look like that throws you. It does, a little. I was beginning to have a sneaking suspicion about an old Mexican woman. But she's no seaman. <laughs> what made you suspect her? She said she saw the dead girl with a man. But she gave me kind of a phony description. Not only that, but she's supposed to be selling soft drinks to the field hands from an old truck. It reeked of liquor. Oh, bootlegging, huh? Hey, that could mean something. What? Well, a report from Austin mentioned liquor stains on that duffel bag. Naturally, they just figured that a bottle had been broken in the bag at one time or another, but... Yeah, but it could be something else, too. Yeah? That bag might have been used for hauling moonshine. Stop the car. Hey, Jace, what's the matter? Slide out. I'm going to Sheffield alone. You stay here. Okay, Jace. What do you want me to work on? Tail old Rosie, the Mexican woman, while I'm gone. Check on any special contacts she makes. Whoever she sees, find out who they are. See if you can run down any who've worked as seamen. I burned up the road to Sheffield. The clerk who'd sold the shoes couldn't help, but I got the information I was after in a repair shop. My show, show, I fix it is, all right? Look, here's who I sold the broken strap, you see? Uh, I remember because of something else, too. I never get a pay for the job. Whose shoes are they? Mrs. Watson. She's a lady two blocks up at Brownwood House. Mrs. Watson, huh? Is her husband around? Oh, no, no, no. It's a go away a month ago. That's why she got no money for pay for the shoes. I know you bother her. She lived with her mother and a little baby. She's a one-year-old. Any idea where her husband went? Oh, no. Sometimes she says to go away for work someplace with the cotton. Sometimes to Galveston to work for the boats. Oh, you've been a sailor, huh? Sailor, everything... Whatever he is, is it not send the money? Last week, she come in. She says she's going to meet him, and she's going to pay me when she's come back. But she's not come back. Hey, just a minute. Why you asking me all this thing, eh? And how come you got it, the shoes? Because Mrs. Watson doesn't need him anymore. She's dead. <laughs> You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Deadhead Freight, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. It wasn't the kind of news you enjoy breaking to a dead girl's mother, and the girl's baby crying in the next room (laughs) didn't help it any. You see, they'd split up about a month ago. And then last week, her husband wrote to her from Bowville. He said he was sorry and he wanted my daughter, Helen, to come to me. I thought she was there with him. Looks like she was for a while. Oh, he promised Helen everything in the letter. Said he had a lot of money for her and their baby. He was never any good. And now the baby's left to me and I'm just too old. I'm sorry, ma'am. Can you give me your son-in-law's full name and his description? But Watson is his name. They call him Bud. Herbert 
Bud Watson. About how tall would you say he was? Yeah, you better pull yourself together, ma'am. Somebody's at the door. I, I'll call out the wind and send him away. I, I don't want to see anybody. No. Oh. What is it, ma'am? What's the matter? Come on, somebody. Open the door. It's him. My son-in-law, Bud. All right, ma'am. Open the door and let him in. Go ahead. Well, what took you so long? Where's Helen? You know where she is. What did you do to her? What did you do to my girl? Are you crazy? What's the matter? Let him go, ma'am, and stand back. What? Ranger, what? Get your hands up and turn around. You killed her. And you got the gall to come here with your own baby cry. Ranger, what is this? Kill who? <laughs> Helen. Where's Helen? Where is she? Don't you know, Watson? Or did you think she'd never be identified? Helen's been murdered? Oh, no. No. You did it. You did it. No, no, Mom, no. I I gave her money. Told her to come back home and I'd meet her here today. (laughs) We was going to take the kid and make a fresh start. How much money did you give your wife? A thousand dollars. That's a lot. Where'd you get it? Come on. I, I, I was bootlegging to the pickers. How long you been getting away with that? Started it last season. Did old Rosie sell any of this stuff for you? How did you know about that? I didn't for sure until now. Come on. We're going back to your place of business in Bowlville. Hi, Jay. Steve. Yeah, I got your message to meet you here. Rosie's over there. Want to get her off the truck? Yeah, she can talk from there. Come on. You too, Watson. Okay. Bud Watson, murdered girl's husband. Been bootlegging here. Rosie's been moving some of the stuff for him. Oh? Huh? Why you keep me from my work, senor? Your work isn't as legal as it could be, Rosie, so sit tight. Uh, yeah, you ever seen this man before? You know she's seen me before. They didn't ask you. How about it, Rosie? Si. All right, Rosie. Now, is he the same man you saw at the bus depot with the girl whose picture I showed you? Si. He's the man. At the bus depot? But that ain't so. I was never with Helen at the bus depot. You didn't meet her when she came down here? No, I tell you. I didn't know what bus she was coming in on. Or even if she would come after she got my letter. First I saw her, she turned up here at the shack. How about when she left to go home? Uh, She only stayed two, three hours, all told. Let her go back to the bus depot alone because... Well, it was getting dark. Near time for the pickers to be coming there to buy drinks. You hear that, Rosie? Yeah. That means one of you is lying. Rosie, tell the truth, senor. No, you don't always tell the truth, Rosie. The first time I asked you about the man you saw, you said he was a stranger, but, a man you'd never seen before. I forget, senor. I, mm. I see a lot of people every day in the fields. I, yeah, I... you trying to kid me? You've been selling liquor for this man. You couldn't mistake him for a stranger. But I do, senor... I make mistake. You want help, I give you help. Rosie tell you all she knows, that's all. Now it was obvious that Rosie was lying, just as I'd suspected her of lying the first time. There had to be a reason for it. We took Bud Watson into Bowlville jail and then went back to search his shack. I can't figure something, Jace. Why won't Watson admit it if he was at the bus station with his wife? That wouldn't hurt him. No, it wouldn't. That's why I think he's telling the truth. Then Rosie must be covering up for something. Covering up for somebody's a better guess. She might have done it herself. No, I don't think so. She's too old to cart a body across the country to the railroad. Well, then you figure she really did see Mrs. Watson at the bus depot with a man, huh? Yeah. The man who killed her to get the $1,000 Bud Watson had given her. Well, then what's Rosie's angle in lying to us? Well, that's an easy one, Steve. Shakedown. Hey, Jace, you're right. Couldn't be anything else. Why, it'd be worth the cut for her to forget seeing the man and say it was Watson instead. Only one thing wrong with it. What? Well, I watched her while you were gone. She didn't make any suspicious contacts, nothing that could have been a payoff. She might have gotten her payoff right after I showed her the Watson girl's picture and told her she'd been murdered. That was before you started a tailor. Yeah, I didn't think of that. She had time. Well, we combed this shack, Jace. Nothing here. What do we do now? Go back to Taylor and Rosie again. If she squeezed hush money out of the man once, she's liable to try it again. They all do. We'll start by watching her house when she comes in from the fields tonight. (laughs) 
We staked out near Rosie's adobe hut, but it got dark and she didn't come in from the fields. I left Steve on watch and went out to look for her, keeping an eye out for her old truck. I found it about five miles out, surrounded by a group of men carrying torches. Hey, what's going on here? Uh, oh, Ranger! Uh, oh, Rosie! You better come! Yeah, what happened? Uh, we was walking into town. We saw the truck here by the side of the road, thought maybe it broke down, so we started to call for old Rosie. Then one of the boys spotted the blood on the ground. What blood? I'll show you over here. Must be old Rosie's, I reckon, because we found her over here in the cotton row. She's dead, Ranger. Somebody cut her throat from ear to ear. <laughs> Rosie had tried to shake down a killer once too often with the usual payoff. I sent a rush call to Steve Clark to tow his horse out and join me. We followed the trail which led to a deserted picker shack way off in a field that looked like it hadn't been cultivated for years. The shack had been occupied, though, recently occupied. But whoever had been there was gone. There's a lamp there, Steve. Light it, yeah. It's clean as a whistle, Jay. Yeah, it's too clean. That floor's been scrubbed mighty hard for a shack like this. It sure has. Especially for a place nobody's living in. Must have been cleaning up blood. Yeah. And there are two other things. What's that? Whoever was hiding here was mighty handy with a knife. Look at the inside of the door. Circle drawn on the wood. Wood chipped where somebody practiced throwing a knife at it. Yeah, good aim. All the marks are right smack inside the circle. Now, what else? Take a look at the lamp you just lit. The cord it's hanging by. Uh, it's just an ordinary hunk of rope. Except for the knot holding the lamp, a running bowline. So the light could be raised or lowered toward the table. A running bowline is a seaman's knot. Yeah, and that cord is just about big enough to be the draw cord from a duffel bag. Our seaman was here, all right. Well, it couldn't have been Watson, Jace. He was safe in jail when Rosie was killed. Yeah. Whoever Rosie saw with Mrs. Watson at the bus depot must have met the girl after she left Watson. After she had the money. Yeah. Married woman on her way home to her baby isn't liable to leave a bus depot with a stranger, is she? Chances are it was somebody she knew. Well, Watson's been a sailor. Think it might have been an old shipmate of his? Let's go see if he remembers one who was handy with a knife. You say somebody killed old Rosie? Yeah. The same man who killed your wife. Now, think and think hard. Yeah. The killer was a seaman. We got reason to think it could be an old shipmate of yours who knew your wife. Oh, but Helen knew shipmates of mine all along the Gulf. I introduced her to lots of them. The one we want had a habit of throwing a knife. Yeah, he drew targets on a door. Never missed. <sighs> Matt Corbett. It was Matt Corbett! How do you know? Any reason for him to be around here? Yeah. He was my partner last year. Bootlegging here. Business got bad and he left. I wrote to him months ago, asking him to come back for this picking, but he never answered me. Did Rosie know him? Sure she did. From last year. That's it, Clark. Rosie'd seen Corbett with Mrs. Watson. That's why he couldn't run with the money after he'd killed her. He had to wait to see if the body was found and identified. And when we moved in and she knew about the murder, she really had him pinned down. And he right. used to be my best friend. A sneak. Well, never mind that now. Where would he run to? I don't know. He was always Roman, like me. Hey, you wrote to him someplace, you said. You must have an address. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, General Delivery at Port O'Connor. There's an old bait shack there. He lived in it whenever he had enough money to stop moving for a while. He's got enough now. What he got from your wife. Come on, Clark. Let's get him. <laughs> Headed for Port O'Connor. Made it by morning and found the abandoned bait shack. Nobody inside, Jace, can see through the window. He isn't here. Yeah, he's probably traveling by freight to avoid being spotted. He couldn't have beaten us here. We rolled too fast. Gonna stake it out and wait? Yeah, our car's out of sight where we left it. He won't spot it coming along the wharf. Come on, let's go inside. Looks like Matt Corbett's the man we're after, all right. Same trademarks here we found on that picker shack at Bullville. Yeah. Knife marks in a circle on the door. Same running bowl and holding the lamp. Draw that burlap sack across the window. That'll make it pretty dark in here, Jace. You want it dark when you're throwing a surprise party. <laughs> He 
Steve, Steve, wake up. Huh? What? Shh. Somebody coming along the wharf. It's dark. What time is it? A little after midnight. Steps are coming closer. Yeah, it must be Corbett. Nothing to bring anybody else this way at this time of night. He's heading for here, all right. Yeah. Let him get all the way inside. And remember, he's got that knife, and he's handy with it. I know. All right, Corbett. Hmm? Never mind that lamp. What did I say? Yeah, stand clear of the light, Steve. Can you handle him? Stop your struggling, Corbett. You don't stink it. My arm. Ah. You broke my arm. All right. Just wrench your shoulder, Corbett. Keep you from throwing that knife for a while. Come on, get up. Better light the lamp now, Steve. It's a good thing you jumped him, Jace. I felt that knife pass in my ear. Look, buried in that wall a good inch. Hey. Rangers, I thought you were a couple of crooks. Uh, what's she doing here? Just dropped in to arrest you for the murder of Helen Watson and old Rosie up at Bowlville. It'd be nice if you could prove it. I haven't been near Bowlville. I think we can prove you were. My marks you left on the door and a few other things. How'd you come back, Freight? Are you kidding? No, I'm serious. You should have rode Pullman. Get your shoes shined on a Pullman. Would have taken that reddish-brown earth off your shoes. Our lab can match that with Bowlville. Watch out for that shoulder. Yeah, that's better, Corbett. Want to cuff him, Jace? No. I think he'll come quiet. All right, Corbett. Let's move. Herbert Bud Watson served the required term for his bootlegging activities, and Matt Corbett was tried and convicted of murder. The sentence of the court was carried out on February 20th, 1939, when at Huntsville Penitentiary, Matt Corbett died in the electric chair. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae, with another interesting story about the Texas Rangers. In the early days of Texas, major disturbances were not infrequent. It was a lusty, brawling, growing territory, and as happens in such a territory, there were days when the streets were not safe for the good citizens. An Easterner, happening into a Texas town at such a time, found shelter in the house of a minister. Everything will be all right soon, he was assured. Later that same afternoon, the minister, who'd been looking out the window, said, Well, friend, the streets are safe now. You may go about your business. The Easterner looked out the window, but all he saw was a lone figure riding casually down the main street on a horse. What makes you think it's safe for me out there now, he asked in bewilderment. The minister pointed to the horseman. Because that feller on the horse is a Texas Ranger, he said. Only folks that aren't safe in this town now are the ones who started the trouble. And when he finds them, they'll wish they'd been peaceable. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production, Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Herb Ellis, Tom Holland, Byron Kane, Tom McKee, and Lillian Byer. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keats. Al Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.